Have you ever wondered how inconvenience could be making your health worse? That's what we'll talk about today. The more convenient things become, the fewer ways there are to use them. I, Yazawa. When talking about this book about inconvenience, and the reason I'm doing three parts on it, because each part of this book is a little bit different from each other, and I thought it brought enough variety to the topic where we could talk about what inconvenience does for our health and what convenience does to destroy our health. He talks early on about the movie Wall-E, and if you haven't seen it, it's a Disney movie, but essentially it's this part where we're all living in spaceships, the planet's wrecked, and we have this one plant that's left, and the whole hope of the world relies on this one plant and getting it back on Earth when Earth is ready for people. But what happens is, is now, because we've been living in this spaceship and everything is so convenient, Everyone just has these spaceship reclining chairs, and they just don't move. They just zip around inside these reclining chairs. Nobody can move. No one can do anything. We've lost any ability of health. Everyone is very overweight, entirely sedentary, because, again, no one moves, and our lives become less. We don't feel like, whoa, look at those cool people. They have the height of convenience by living in outer space. We feel sad for them. And yet that's what we're doing to our lives right now. We have convenient food. We don't have to exercise. People didn't spend time exercising because they had to work for their food. They had to work every day. Again, I mentioned I was reading Little House on the Prairie. You worked from sunup to sundown. You had to get food. You had to grow crops. You had to take care of the homestead. You had to fix things that were broken. You had to walk 78 miles for a job. You had to haul in lumber so that you could heat the house. It was constant effort all the time. And I'm not advocating for that kind of life. It's very difficult to do for sure. I've been watching all these homestead shows and You see how difficult it is to strive for every ounce of things that you have in your life. But it also is making us way more. We're less in shape. Our brain is less engaged. And we eat a lot of junk food. Now, he's not saying, and the point of this book is not to talk about junk food as being toxic or anything about it. He says there's really two problems when it comes to eating so much junk food is first of all, it's very calorie dense. When we would eat something in nature, like an apple, you know, if you eat a whole apple, I think it's 90 calories. But if you were to eat something that big that was junk food, it would possibly be four or 500 calories, you know, just any kind of a dessert or a thing. The food we eat now is so dense, he says, less filling, And then it causes us to overeat because it's not as filling. The second problem with it is, is that it's all engineered to make us love the taste, to crave more for it. The more we eat sweets, the more we crave sweets. (laughs) You can talk to me about this. I have a problem with Diet Coke. The more caffeine you drink, the more you crave caffeine and you crave Diet Coke. I gave up at one point drinking soda with caffeine in it because I felt it was an unhealthy addiction. And I had just had surgery, and so I had painkillers for the next three weeks that I had to take. And I thought, wouldn't this be the perfect time to give up drinking caffeine? Because when I'm going through all these big headaches that you get from getting over caffeine, I wouldn't feel a thing because I'm on heavy-duty (laughs) painkillers. And so I did. And then A few years after that, I just got back into it again, and now I really need to focus on removing it. To our problems in life, if we're not eating healthy, if we're not challenging ourselves on on what we want to eat, we can eat and eat and eat and eat some more and go out to dinner. And to be honest with you, half the time, I even forget if I ate something. I'll say, oh, I'm going to eat a really big dinner because I didn't have lunch today. And then halfway through cooking dinner, I think, I had lunch today. What are you talking about? Of course I had lunch today. We can't even remember the food we eat because it's so 
unmemorable. We just drone through the day and we don't even know what we eat. And that was part of the thing. Um, I work with a trainer and she was having me write food down. It's hard to write food down. It's annoying. There's all different aspects of writing meals down. But the one thing it does is it reminds you, oh, you already had a snack. You did eat lunch. Boy, you ate a big lunch. And so there's ways of getting more mindful about what we eat so that we're not just droning through our day and forgetting. I'm trying different methods right now when it comes to recording my food to see if I can do something a little bit different. I don't enjoy recording my food, but instead I'm trying to think more about what those portions are, measuring the food, not itemizing the food, and then also making sure that they're the right makeup, this much protein, this much carbs. I used to eat carbs as a meal. No longer do that. Right now, I only eat carbs as a small side dish. I've returned them to where they probably belong. He talks about snacking. We don't even remember the foods that we snack. Again, they're set to be addictive. They're filling a psychological need. They're filling a physiological need. And again, because they're so calorie dense and they're so addictive, then we eat dinner and then we have room for more dessert. This is a problem that we're putting ourselves into. It was funny. My friend and I, when we were roommates, we never ate dessert or rarely ate dessert. And then when she got married, her husband always had dinner and then dessert. And to tell you a secret, I think there was a second dessert in there. So there was some sort of a jello or sweet thing like cranberries that were part of the dinner. And then there was dessert after that. So it was almost like two desserts. And suddenly she got in the habit of eating desserts, which was something that when she was my roommate, we never did. But when you get used to it, you start craving it. Now, I took the other path. I don't have desserts and I never think about it. So when you get addicted to certain kinds of foods or certain types of events, it's hard to break that chain. But I have other addictions, namely carbs and pop and other things that aren't healthy for me. So I have my own things too. But when we just kind of drone from one meal to the next, not thinking about what we eat, maybe eating processed food, which is very, very, again, dense, we start having struggles. Then he says we get sad or we have upsets in our lives, and then we're comfort eating, we're stress eating. And so if you live in where I live, we are big mac and cheese eaters, and I guess probably big mac and cheese eaters is the right term, but we're just sort of trying to numb all the things that we're having, sedating ourselves with food. And it becomes a problem as we start injuring our lives, as we start damaging our heart, as we start getting type 2 diabetes. We start having this response to the food that we're eating to solve our problems. And so the lack of inconvenience when it comes to our food becomes less and less. We order a meal, we go out to a restaurant, we cook something that's easy, like a pizza, because it's very time efficient. And boy, is that pizza good. But because we're not doing the inconvenient thing, which would be eating healthy, unprocessed foods, spending time exercising, going for a walk, this convenience of junk food, of sedentary lifestyle, of eating whatever we want, whenever we want it, Boy, now that's poisoning our system. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I went and ordered delivery Taco Bell. And I hadn't eaten out at a meal for almost a year at that point. And when I ate it, it was so good. And I was so glad I had it. And then I thought, nope, you do not want to get involved in this. You don't want to start ordering food out. Enjoy the meal. Have a good time. But this is the end of it. And I didn't. I, I didn't order it again because I could see where that convenience of someone bringing me junk food would have become a huge problem. And what happens, he says, too, is as we get this convenience, we start eating the wrong food. Our reward systems get off. That dopamine spike of eating bad food. 
we get guilty, we get hungry later. It's screwing up the whole system of what we're supposed to be doing, eating throughout the day, meeting a physical need that we have where we add weight. And he says that we're feasting, whether we keep our weight or we add our weight, and rarely do we feel hunger. That's what made me think about this in the first place is I saw that ad that came out that had like a Snickers bar or something like that. And it says, feeling a little hungry? Have a Snickers bar. And I thought, gosh, when I was a kid, we weren't supposed to spoil our supper. That was the thing your parents said, don't spoil your supper. I survived, right? I would go from lunch all the way to dinner. And you know what didn't happen? I never fainted from hunger. Now, this concept, and I have it too, where you think, hmm, I'm a little bit hungry. Think I'm going to go grab a snack. Hmm, I'm a little bit hot. Think I'm going to go get some ice cream. Can't stand one moment of feeling hungry, of feeling hot. We get bigger snacks, more junk food snacks, and we're losing touch with that activity in our body that tells us we've had enough, that tells us we've eaten enough, that we keep processing and processing this desire to eat more, and we never get to the part where we're losing weight. And even being hungry, particularly at night, helps us eat bad cells in our body, that we're constant state of being fed It's making us weaker. It's making us sicker. It's making us more overweight. And we're losing the natural process in our body to destroy bad cells. He said that there's a discussion of this by Dr. Panda, who was at Cedar sinai I helped Cedar sinai for a couple of years. I love them. And in the book, The Obesity Code, it is making us worse even neurologically. He said the body just never shuts down. We never get focused. Quote, think about a hungry wolf versus a lion who just ate. Which one is more focused? So because we never have that moment where we're hungrier, we never have that time when we're that focused, when our body is going through the process, we're not sleeping as well, and again, we're getting sicker because of it. Then we have to spend all our money trying to get healthy again, trying to hire a trainer, exercise more, or go see a doctor because now we have type 2 diabetes. And as he mentioned in this book, in the first episode of the series, what is really inconvenient in life is when we lose our health. We talked about that television anchor man that we had in town who had a stroke and he just dreamed of all the people walking around outside in his house, just going for a simple walk. He couldn't even do that anymore. And all he dreamt about was, I hope someday I can go for a walk. When we lose our health, that is the ultimate loss of convenience. Nothing is convenient anymore. If we have type 2 diabetes, we're checking our sugar all the time. We're taking medication because of it. We maybe don't feel very well. When we have heart disease, we can't do the things we want. And in his case, he had a stroke, couldn't even walk around the block. So he says, in the end, our happier path is living a happier life. We tend to think that we'll have the happy life when we retire. But if we don't exercise, we don't take care of ourselves, we don't go for a walk, lift weights, do cardio, We'll never get to that place in our retirement where we're healthy enough to do the things we want to do. We need to start taking inconvenience of our health seriously. Do the hard things. And he said that the muscles are a great analogy to this. When we lift weights, we rip the muscles. The muscles grow bigger because we work them. And then he says, quote, muscles are thirsty. More muscles demand more blood which means your heart works harder and you get stronger. It's like that virus analogy. It makes you stronger. The inconvenience of strength training and cardio produces a strong, muscled human being with stronger hearts, stronger lungs, and it avoids the inevitable becoming weaker, becoming sicker, not having the retirement you want to have, 
or the life you want to have. He quotes Katie Bauman, who writes some very amazing books about biomechanical things in our body, like our feet and that. But she said that we're all suffering, quote, from diseases of captivity, that we're almost like whales in captivity, where you can't move enough, we can't swim far enough, and so we just become lazy and fat inside of our pens. But here's the thing, we're doing it to ourselves. We're putting ourselves behind desks, we're putting ourselves at the computer, whether we're playing games or working. We make Amazon bring everything to us, and so our lives have become lacking in any activity at all. I mean, even for me, I work out with a trainer. My friend and I uh, share the time, but I can tell you that when I get back home, I'm at the desk. I'm working for the rest of the day. And so I have my watch that reminds me to stand up every hour. And I'm grateful for that because sometimes I could just sit there for hours and hours and hours and just keep working away. It destroys our immune system. And eventually we become someone who can't even get out of the chair anymore. I think that's why my friend and I are going to this trainer, because we could see things that we used to be able to do easily suddenly becoming harder. And there's a thing that's called sarcopenia, which basically means now you are so inactive, you can't get out of chairs. Your body has degraded to the point, and the correlation with death with people who have sarcopenia is very high. If you can keep your abilities to get up, get on the floor, stand up again. I mean, believe it or not, you will lose the ability to stand up from the floor if you never do it. You don't even see it coming. But those challenges to our body are good. Talks about how when we stop giving children peanuts because we were afraid of peanut allergies, The peanut allergies bloomed like crazy because it's actually giving children peanuts when they're young that gives them the ability to eat peanuts. Otherwise, they become allergic. Talk about pets when you're kids makes it less likely that you'll have allergies to pets. He says the University of Chicago microbiome scientist said, quote, dirt is good. When you spend time outside and you're exposed to all the microbes of the world, you get better and you get stronger and you get more able to fight things off. He says that as soon as you start feeling confident and healthy, you start getting the sense of euphoria, connectedness, confidence, and calm. He calls it the pink cloud. He says, quote, we've realized we've pulled ourselves out of the slow death and become eager to live. So in the end, us giving ourselves these challenges, making this convenient food and lack of exercise convenience higher in our lives is destroying us. But getting out of there, pulling out of it, and being more inconvenient with food but eating better food, denying ourselves food so we're not eating all the time, and exercising, it's going to make us better all around. So my challenge to you is think about something that you've been doing that is very convenient, but very unhealthy for your physical being. Is it eating out too much, ordering food, or is it just not exercising because it takes too much time? Challenge yourself to do one thing a week that is inconvenient, but healthier. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast, and if you could, leave a review. The reviews, believe it or not, help other people find the podcast. It also seems to help more if you do it on Apple Podcasts, but leave a review wherever you want. I appreciate you doing it and helping me out. And remember, our walk back to healthy living starts with small steps. Small steps.